In the world of One Piece, you don't just have a blue sea, but also a white sea in the sky. That place is clearly associated with heaven. Perhaps there is a red sea associated with hell. It only makes sense if heaven is up in the sky, then hell would be underground. In today's video, I'm going to talk about a wide array of topics that are all linked together. First, I'll explain the Red Sea, aka Hell. Next, I'll explain how I believe the Red Sea creates the White Sea. Then, we'll go over the races of Kaido, Oars, and King. After that, we'll go deeper into what makes Lunarian so special. I'll show the possible connection between the Red Sea and the Red Line. We'll even go over how Wano fits into all of this. Lastly, we'll talk about how Hell may be relevant in the future of this story. Now I know Impel Down is referred to as Hell and is also underground, but I believe you can find a place even lower than Impel Down. In fact, I'd say even lower than Fishman Island. This is a place so low that is below the seafloor, aka the Earth's crust. Probably located within the mantle of the Earth, where you can find both solid and liquid rock. I'm sure you've guessed by now what the Red Sea is. The white sea in heaven isn't made of white water, but rather the clouds in the sky. So perhaps the red sea of hell is made of magma underground. But it isn't that simple. The white sea is made of special clouds with a crucial component known as pyrobloin. Without pyrobloin, the sea and island clouds wouldn't have the property of liquids and solids. Thus would just be plain old realistic clouds. And just like not all clouds in the world of one piece can form a white sea, the same is true for what goes on underground. Not all magma makes up the Red Sea. Rather, it requires pyrobloin mixed with the magma to create the Red Sea. In fact, pyrobloin comes from the Red Sea to begin with. The word pyro is of Greek origin and refers to fire and heat. Better yet, the White Sea wouldn't exist if pyrobloin wasn't sent up into the atmosphere by volcanic eruptions. Pyrowater is what we would call the liquid that makes up the Red Sea. To figure out what pyrobloin contributes to the Red Sea, we must figure out what it would take for an island surrounded by magma to be inhabitable. Well, obviously the denizens of the Red Sea would be super tough to live in that environment. We'll get to the inhabitants later. But right now, let's talk about pyrowater. For starters, I could imagine that pyrobloin would cool down the magma now, don't get me wrong, pyro water would still be hot, but it wouldn't be as hot as normal magma. This matters because pyro water wouldn't be hot to the point that it could instantly kill someone with vice admiral level of armament hockey. A person with decent quality armament hockey might be able to survive for about 10 seconds before it got deadly. Someone like Odin, for example, could probably swim in it for minutes. Which leads to the second property that pyrobloin grants magma. That would be giving it a consistency more similar to water. So much so that a person tough enough could swim in it and a boat of good enough material could sail on the Red Sea. Speaking of material, let's talk about how an ecosystem of the Red Sea would obtain resources. They are surrounded by rock so they certainly have mining covered when it comes to gathering materials to craft using stone. Perhaps something like the Adam tree, with large enough roots, could make its way into the Red Sea, thus providing wood and possibly even sunlight. We know that the Adam tree is not only very large, but also incredibly durable. So, should the Straw Hats ever travel to the Red Sea, you know that the Thousand Sunny would have no problem sailing. The Adam tree could be the opposite of the E tree, in the sense that instead of providing light, it might actually feed off of and take away light from the Red Sea. There is most certainly no natural sunlight, but at least fire is probably found all over a place like this. Not only would the Red Sea be incredibly hot, but to make conditions even worse, it is most likely filled with noxious fumes that smell just as bad as they are deadly. This would be the result of minerals constantly burning and melting. Would this place get water? Possibly, but it certainly would not be normal water. Something you're going to hear from me often throughout this theory is that things from the Red Sea tend to be exceptionally tough and durable. Hard water is water that contains an excessive amount of minerals. Also there is heavy water 
which is denser than typical water due to having deuterium. Heavy water is also known as D2O and what sets it apart from regular water is the fact that it has hydrogen isotopes with the mass double of the ordinary hydrogen. Combining the concepts of hard water with heavy, I have thought of the name robust water. Normal water would instantly evaporate in the Red Sea. Robust water will still evaporate but nowhere near as fast because it is durable enough to stay in liquid form, which would be long enough for it to be consumed. This water wouldn't be safe enough for the average person to drink, however it is necessary for a demon to stay hydrated in the Red Sea. How they would get water in the first place would be from robust rain. That rain would come from pyroclastic clouds, also known as volcano clouds. There may even be some living beings in this hellish place that are so tough inside and out that can actually drink pyro water from the Red Sea. In fact, there may even be creatures that live inside the Red Sea. Imagine how terrifyingly strong a Red Sea King could be. Perhaps as strong as a dragon. Hint, hint. Speaking of which, the animals that live on land in the Red Sea would be those you would consider to be monsters. Down in the Red Sea, dinosaurs, aka dragons, may have never gone extinct. With all that being said, would there be any intelligent life form on the islands of the Red Sea? Well, let's look back at the White Sea to figure this one out. The citizens of heaven noticeably resemble angels due to their wings. You know, we've never been given an explanation as to why characters like Moria or Kaido look the way that they do. Perhaps there are a race of people that resemble demons that come from a place where the sea is red. Also, the Earth's mantle is extremely huge considering that it is the largest layer of the Earth. The height of the mantle is 3,000 kilometers, which would make someone like Oars look like a pebble. So one could imagine why an island on the Red Sea could have an entire race of giants as large as Oars inhabited there. I've had this theory for quite some time, but it didn't seem to have legs to go anywhere. Mostly due to me thinking it wouldn't have much impact on the story. However, two other theorists have made me reconsider. First, Sawyer Seven Mage said this. What if King's race was responsible for creating the red line? Like, what if they were producing like these volcanic eruptions with their heat? Or, you know, they were doing something like molding lava to create this giant red mountain. So that made me think of my theory. What if King's race were like Nephilim? a race of people that have the aspects of both angel and demon. What's interesting is rather than saying King's race of people lived in the sky or above the clouds, Marco specifically said that King's people lived on top of the red line. Red line, red sea, combine our theories together and it tells us more about King's people. If like King knows about the red line, right? then he probably knows why the red line is indestructible. He probably knows why the red line is so tough. And so I'm pretty sure that he's going to incorporate that indestructibility factor into his fight with Zoro. And you would expect the demon race to have acclimated to living in extreme temperatures if they were to live on islands in the Red Sea. They probably evolved to have extremely tough bodies. The average fishman is said to be 10 times stronger than the average human. Well, I'd guess that the average demon could be 20, maybe even 50 times stronger than the average human. Chances are, the average person wouldn't last a single day being on an island in the Red Sea. However, what if the Lunarians like King didn't actually have as tough a body as the demons to live in the Red Sea? Perhaps they use hockey to overcompensate for their bodies not being as tough. In my Sunman theory, I said this about how the environment can also affect the development of hockey. Have you ever noticed that in Wano, a lot of the animals around have flame patterns? I'll just leave it at that for now, but please stay tuned and check out Understanding Hockey Part 4. Similar to how I theorized that fishmen have developed fishmen karate by resonating with their environment, of which was vastly water, the same could be true for the demons and king's race. The demons could have adapted to the solid earth around them that could withstand the heat. As a result, it heavily strengthened their armament hockey. 
King's race could have resonated with the heat of the Red Sea. The Lunarians trained their hardening as well, but in addition to that, they also became one with the intense heat of the Red Sea. Thus learned to manifest fire through the use of armament. In fact, Zoro compares the heat of King's fire specifically to magma. This is a topic that I love to talk about, just check out my Understanding Hockey series. I could go deeper into how there is a link between evolution and hockey, so I will, but not right now. It'll derail this theory, so I'll make a part 2 to this Red Sea theory, which focuses on understanding what makes demons and Lunarians so powerful and how they obtained that power in the first place. Let's move on to another Red Sea related topic by hearing another thing Sora 7 Mage has said. And since we know that Sea Stone has pyroblowing in it, and we know that Sea Stone originated in Wano, and we also know that the Kazuki clan created the Poneglyphs, now I'm thinking that maybe both the Poneglyphs and Sea Stone contain pyroblowing, and that maybe the difference between creating a Poneglyph and Sea Stone has to do with the amount of moisture that gets mixed into the pyroblowing. So Sea Stone would have to have more moisture in it, specifically moisture from the sea, because Sea Stone is supposed to have the energy of the sea in it. Also, since we know that pyroblowing comes from volcanoes, Volcanoes, I'm wondering if Mount Fuji is actually maybe an inactive volcano, and maybe that was the volcano that the Kazuki clan used to create the Poneglyphs. It never ceases to amaze me how he just casually comes up with those mind-blowing theories in weekly manga reviews. Somehow his observation and speculation in this instance matches up perfectly with mine. Put them together and it creates a full picture that leads to an even better theory. This is what helped me put together that Pyroboyne mixed with Maga is what creates the Red Sea. The Mount Fuji of Wano must lead straight into the Red Sea. The volcanic eruptions is probably considered an upstream for the demons down in hell. Just like how the people of Earth make their way up to Skypea. This would explain why Majins like Or and Onis like Kaido have such a deep connection and fascination with Wano. Even the Lunarians have a connection due to Luna referring to the moon. Four out of the five main families of Wano also refer to the moon. Could it be that those from the Red Sea bestowed their knowledge upon Wano citizens? It may have been the Lunarians. My buddy Sean the Blump God pointed out to me that Tenguyama does happen to have wings similar to King. Lunarians may have learned how to turn their wings black and then with that knowledge taught the samurais how to turn their blades black. In fact, Shishui has been noted to be heavier than the average short. We have seen that as King's flames go away, so does his durability, showing a connection between his fire ability and armament hardening. Due to losing his durability, he also gets faster, aka lighter. That just might be evidence to show that the same method for making blades heavier and black originates from the method Lunarians use to make their own bodies tougher. Also, samurai and even the animals have shown to have a connection to fire, like the Lunarians. The people of Wano must have somehow learned how to use lava that falls out of Mount Fuji to craft various things. It makes perfect sense when the magma cools down, it hardens and turns into stone. And if the magma was once considered the Red Sea, then it could explain why the sea stones had the essence of the sea. Now we've never seen a devil fruit user be weak to ice the same way they are weak to sea stones, so I don't think sea stones are as simple as being solidified red sea. I speculate that the people of Wano must somehow know how to trap frequencies in whatever they craft. Implementing frequencies in objects would also explain why cursed swords exist, and why the swords they make have a will of their own. That speculation is a whole can of worms and a theory for another day. Once again, let's use the White Sea as a frame of reference to help me speculate. When Usopp tried summoning a White Sea from the Milky Dial, it didn't work. The cloud cannot retain the form it had in its original environment. The same is most likely true for Pyrowater. When Pyrowater is exposed to the atmosphere on the Blue Sea, it will turn into red colored rock. Then perhaps as Sawyer speculated, Lunarian somehow involved with using the Red Sea to create the Red Line. During the process of pyro water turning into red rock, the pyroblowing most likely has two destinations. 
first some of the pyrobloid evaporates and travels up the Earth's atmosphere. Lava can't evaporate like water does, but remember pyro water has the properties of water as well as magma. So in that first moment, before it turns into rock, it will behave like water. Once it turns into rock, it loses its essence of the sea, thus can't be considered sea stone. So no, don't think that I'm saying that the red line is just one huge piece of sea stone. Secondly, pyroblend can also be found within the red rock. Now it might sound like I just contradicted myself. How could I say that pyrobloin is in the rock that makes up the red line, but the red line itself isn't sea stone? It's actually quite simple. Imagine there was a ball of lava from the Red Sea. The surface of the pyro water would cool down first and the core last. Pyrobloin may have evaporated off of the surface of this ball made of pyro water, but if the surface is now solid rock, then how would the pyrobloin within be able to escape? The lava inside the ball would turn into rock, however pyrobloin would remain inside, thus the remaining pyrobloin inside would also cool down and turn solid. Now it begs the question, could the pyrobloin within the red rock be of use? Breaking the red rock is out of the question, considering the red line is said to be indestructible. Melting the rock is another option, however, if it turns into power water, then the power ruin will just evaporate unless the melting process is done on the Red Sea. So if you want to get to that power ruin on the Blue Sea, then melting it will just bring you back to square one. The way to successfully extract the power ruin is by doing what is known as smelting. The main difference between melting and smelting is that melting converts a solid substance into liquid, whereas smelting converts an ore to its purest form. Eureka! That's the solution. Smelt the red rock and extract the ore of pure pyrobloin. With this pyrobloin ore, I believe that the craftsmen of Wanos learn how to mix this with a special metal capable of containing and emitting frequencies. It's possible that it's not even the metal that is special, but solely the craftsman's own skill. Regardless, one way or the other, I believe I've uncovered how it is sea stones are made. After pyrobloin is extracted from the pyro water, I believe the magma will still turn into a rock form, but perhaps it is still close to being indestructible, so this leftover magma could be what is used to make the poneglyphs. The road poneglyphs may be red due to the red rock not going through the smelting and extraction process. By the way, didn't Koala mention that Doflamingo was getting weapons containing liquor, iron ore from one or more suppliers? If it were to be only from one supplier, then that would be Kaido. Is liquor iron ore the same as the ore I'm speculating to be pure pyrobloin? It sure is possible. According to Koala, there's more than one place in the world where you can find liquor iron ore. However, Hawkins claimed that all sea stone originates from Wana. So I can only think of two scenarios. There's more than one Red Sea under the Earth's surface. So there may be more volcanoes or other pathways that connect the Blue Sea to the Red Sea. In this case, what Hawkins says could still be true if only the land of Wano knows how to take pure pyrobloin, aka liquor iron ore, and turn it into sea stone. That could mean that Doflamingo was gathering LIO from across the globe to give to Kaido, who would then have his factories make weapons with pyrobloin in them. A weapon with pyrobloin in it sure does make it sound like it is a sea stone weapon. We know that island clouds have pyrobloin, yet none of the weapons that use a milky dial have ever been stated to be a weakness to Devil Fruit users. Not to say that this disproves weapons with LIO in them are sea stone weapons, but there is another possibility. Perhaps liquor iron ore and pure pyrobloin ore are two different minerals and instead are mixed together to then create sea stones. I like this idea better. If I had to guess, what makes liquor iron ore special is its ability to trap as well as emanate aura and frequencies. I wouldn't be surprised if liquor iron ore is the metal used to make cursed and or devil fruit weapons. I'm having a ton of fun speculating and giving little lessons on things like D2O or smelting. But how does this all affect the story of One Piece besides world building? 
let's finish part one by talking about the possible direction of the plot. Lastly, if you watched a video dubbed the greatest One Piece theory of all time, then you'll know it has been theorized that One Piece is located underground. I don't necessarily agree that it would be under any slobby, but that might be one of the entrances to hell, and perhaps one of the islands on the Red Sea does have the One Piece on it. In fact, it would explain why precise coordinates are needed to find the One Piece. If the One Piece were simply to just be on some random island in the Blue Sea, then someone could have accidentally come across Claftail at any time. However, if it were to be an island that is underground, then it would be completely out of sight. Technically, that would be true if the island was above ground in the sky, but that is something that could be seen within the sight, especially for those that can fly, have a telescope, or observation hockey enhanced eyesight. We might even see the crew travel to the Red Sea before they go to Laugh Tale. I say this because of the upcoming One Piece movie. Coincidentally, while I'm making a video about the Red Sea, they announce a movie called One Piece Film Red. Could this film be a chance for us and the Straw Hats to explore the Red Sea? Something we most likely won't be able to do in the manga because of time constraints. We don't have a lot to go off of as of now, but we did get to see one of the main characters of the movie. Even then, we don't have a lot of details, but there is one notable thing about this woman. She has wings. This movie may introduce and or foreshadow the history between angels and demons. Despite me having more to say about One Piece being on the Red Sea, I'll end the main video here before I get too redundant. Stay after the brief end card to see me go over a cover page that potentially foreshadows Laugh Tale being located in hell. That's it for Food for Thought. I made it short and sweet, but if you'd like to hear me elaborate more, then stick around for the secret ending. We like food for thought? Then check out the rest of my channel. Want to see some actually well thought out analysis and theories with a bunch of evidence to back them up? Well then check out my series, Deep Dive. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed part one. Part two will be out next week, and part three may not be out for a while since I have other theories that I'm making videos for. My next upcoming theory video series will be about how I believe we will see a new iteration of Nightmare Luffy, and how that will lead into Gear 5th. If I can describe the next installment of the Red Sea Theory in two sentences, it will be this. When heaven meets hell and angels become demons, we will learn how it is that Lunarians gain the power of devils. Now let's look at this cover page from chapter 941. So if you look at this cover page, what I find interesting, basically the signs showing you the directions to go and how they almost seem like contradictory. And they're all just pointing in different directions saying one thing is here and one thing is there. And it almost seems as if they're also based on things that have to do with the straw hats themselves. Like if you look, one of them say cotton candy, it looks like it's saying cotton candy kingdom maybe. That's something, you know, specifically for Chopper. You know, he's known as Cotton Candy Chopper and all that. There's one that says good place that is X'd out and is backwards. There's another one that says home that is also that way. The hell is in the same direction as Arcadia. Then there's somewhere that's in a random direction. The beach is in another direction. So what's interesting about the contradictions is Arcadia basically means like a world of peace and then you also have hell in the same direction as the world of peace so it's like how does hell also where you find peace that doesn't make sense and then you can see home is in the same direction as good place but good place is x'd out so it's basically saying it is not a good place so it's you would think that good place x'd out would be in the same direction as hell and home would ideally be in the same direction as arcadia but it's not it looks as if Robin is trying to go to a good place, is trying to go home. But the direction on the road has an arrow literally saying, go in this direction. It is meant to go forward, which is to hell in Arcadia. Co um, Chopper has the shirt, cotton candy, right? So obviously he's trying to go to the cotton candy kingdom. Um, Nami's trying to go to the spa resort, which I can only assume is probably where the beach is. So these characters have intended places that they want to go. Frankie 
has a shirt that says walk back, weirdly enough. But on his vehicle, it says stop crying. Sanji says with you to anywhere. So basically, I think there's almost a message you can get out of this. Sanji's saying with you to anywhere, meaning I think it's to Luffy. I'm going with Luffy anywhere he goes. So, you know, that's just basically what his set intentions are. The other Straw Hats don't seem to have that same intention. They're going where they want to go. Uh, you can't necessarily say the same about Usopp or Zoro. And that could mean something about their intention where either they have no place to go or it could just go without saying that they're going to go with Luffy. Now, Luffy's hand says end of sea. I'm kind of skipping Brook. Brook says panty heaven, but it's like that's not a place to go. Um... But anyway, Luffy says end of sea. Now, I believe the end of the sea is the same place as hell and Arcadia. And this might have to do foreshadowing to where the One Piece is. The One Piece is in hell. You have to go through hell to get to Arcadia, which is peace. Now, you could just go back home, but home isn't a good place. You know, if you look, Frankie's shirt says walk back, but also says stop crying. And if you remember when Roger and them find the One Piece, they're laughing, but they're also crying. Funny enough. But yeah, the road itself having the arrows telling them to go to hell, I think just is almost like destiny. Like this is the direction they're meant to go. If they want to go back, that isn't where they should go. They could go back, but that's not how things should be. They have to go to where they have to go, no matter how despair inducing it is, no matter how much it makes them feel like there's no hope. They got to keep going forward. It may seem like hell, but at some point they're going to reach peace. But yeah, I have a I have a video up about what I believe not what I think the One Piece is, but I have a video that it's so quick, I'll probably just be playing it on the screen right now. And it's about how I believe that the One Piece is something that isn't that brings joy or makes laughter out of like happiness, but rather brings laughter out of despair and desperation and almost going manic and becoming, you know, just maniacal laughter and, you know, just being overcome with despair. So that kind of goes hand in hand with what I'm saying here, which is the one piece could be in hell. The one piece could be like a story of how awful the situation in the real world is. Maybe, you know, they'll find out that the man behind the curtain, whether it be emo or whatever, is an undefeatable, unstoppable force and everything they do is false. And they think they have some type of control, but ultimately Emu is in control of everything and there's nothing they can do. It could be something like that. And it's like, oh, well, this is hell. There's nothing else to do. It'd definitely be hell to Luffy because Luffy is all about freedom. So if he knew that his life was actually in control of someone else and everything he does is within the bounds of someone else, he would be like, oh, that's off. But, uh, yeah, this is just rambling that's why i saved it for the secret ending there's really nothing to say this cover page could literally be nothing but just randomness but i think it could actually have some kind of foreshadowing or there is some message in there that has to do with the one piece thanks for watching <laughs>